instead of using a descriptor to to describe the food, good, bad, healthy, unhealthy, let's just let food be food. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. A skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. As a dietitian working with eating disorders, we've all dealt with tears around meals, around certain foods, around certain thoughts about foods and eating and body. So this is probably one of the most entertaining episodes <laughs> that I've had. It starts out a little slow, but if you hang in there with us, you're going to get some really great nuggets. And I just feel like Valerie Grogan, who is this dietitian, CEDRD, should be a stand-up comedian. So the, her career choice was actually color-coded. That's how she decided. She talks about how sometimes we as the RD are the most despised team member. There's a lot of talk in here about Laureate, and that's for good reason. They do sponsor this episode. But if you want to get a taste of the language and kind of the schedule of what the EDRD would be like in an inpatient setting, it can be really helpful to listen in. But also, just like how how does the dietitian handle the tears? And the definition of healthy, valerieisms on paleo and keto and clean and how to work with families. Bottom line, we have to let food be food. There's no morality or judgment with food and how to hold the line with boundaries. Sometimes we aren't going to be loved as dietitians, but we got to, you know, help each other out. So she recommends several different books that helped her get started, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Valerie Grogan, dietitian, we are so, so grateful that you're with us today. Happy to be here. Hello, hello. I wish everybody listening could see the wall behind you. It really is so cute. (laughs) Yeah, we'll have to tell I think I have just about every color represented in my office. (laughs) And a few phrases like, when in doubt, take another bite and other things that clients and patients have given her. Believe there's good in the world. And so, yeah, that's what we're seeing right now. All right, Valerie. So just to warm up here, mountains or beach? Well, I'm going to have to go beach right now. It does kind of depend on the day, but as it's a Wednesday, it feels like a beach kind of day. (laughs) It's a Wednesday. Okay. (laughs) But maybe a Thursday is mountains. A little bit more mountainous, maybe more (laughs) cup of tea as opposed to Mai Tai. Okay. Got it. (laughs) And then breakfast or dinner? Oh, definitely breakfast. 167% breakfast. Yeah, we hear that a lot. I would say the majority of people pick breakfast. What's your ideal breakfast meal? Oh, well, anything to do with cheese. So whether it's a cheese omelet, maybe a breakfast sandwich, you really can't go wrong with eggs benedict though. I guess we'll sprinkle cheese on some hash browns. Just got to have cheese in there somewhere. It's really important. Mm, If someone were to go visit Tulsa, and have breakfast at a restaurant, where would you recommend? Girl, that's a hard question. (laughs) Okay, well, it depends, breakfast or brunch. If we're brunching, we're going to Nola's or Smoke. Okay. Um, If we're just doing breakfast, got to stick with a classic like BBD. That's Brookside by Day. Okay. Uh, Okay. Nice to know. Thank you. And the last question, audiobook or paper book? Paper paper. What you can't see on the other side of my office is the massive bookcase full of all of the books. I might have to ask you after our recording about the books you have. I'm getting, I'm just now getting an office of my own and I have a bookshelf, but I have like five books. So 
<laughs> I no, might I have, have to take all of the books. All of the books. And that's all what this podcast is about too, is really how did you learn? Like what books are, are you going to highlight for us today that helped form you and helped to bring you to where you are? And so before we get into that, I want to ask you, and this can be a little traumatizing, but I'm going to bring you back to exam day, your RD exam day. What do you remember about that day? Uh, pencil or um, keyboard? It was electronic. Um, I remember very specifically that my patients had, or my parents, my patients, oh good God, my <laughs> parents had two bottles of champagne on ice just in case either way we were drinking champagne either way. I remember I wore a blue dress because blue is supposed to be a lucky color. And I remember the one question that I remember, I remember calculating a tube feed. And the next question I remember was asking me what the third chamber in an industrial dishwasher did. And I was just like, oh my gosh, we went from two feeds to dishwashers. This is, our dietitians <laughs> are nuts. That's what wow. I remember. Yeah. It really highlights the scope of things that we have to know. Oh my gosh. Yes. Ugh. I don't think I got any dishwasher questions. Thank God. I, I would not have been able to answer that. Lucky you. <laughs> and I didn't get the champagne because I was so, my stomach hurt so much. My friend said, let's go out and I couldn't do it. <laughs> so good. <day. laughs> okay. Well, how did you get into the field of nutrition and eating disorders? Well, I just kind of fell into it. My original major in college was biochemistry and molecular biology. I'm a really huge nerd. Like I will really refrain from giving Star Trek comments as much as possible. I'm a huge, huge nerd. And science is really my first love. The the more science that's in something, the more I love it. And I was a freshman research scholar at OSU. I worked in a lab and I grew bacteria and I mutated it with UV radiation. And that was so exciting. However, there are only about five people in the lab and I am like as extroverted as you could possibly be. And that was not enough people in my life for me. So I sat down with a course catalog and I circled in one color, everything that all my credits transferred and another color, everything that sounded interesting. And that crossover ended up being in nutrition. So sophomore year, I switched to nutrition and had to play a bunch of catch up work because there's so many classes that we have to go through. So I took a lot of summer classes, a lot of winter classes, able to graduate on time still, and then ended up at the University of Memphis for clinical nutrition in my, for my master's degree. And I actually did a lot of work with the geriatric population. I worked at a couple of nursing homes. I did a lot of work with the VA hospital. So I assumed that when I came back, I would go work for the veterans hospital because grumpy old men are my most favorite thing of all time. I just, grumpy old men are my jam. So when I moved back to Tulsa, there were no jobs in dietetics, absolutely none. And since I decided living under a bridge didn't really sound like my cup of tea, I actually took a long-term substitute teaching job at a high school here in town. And I taught physics for a year, decided that teenagers were not my most favorite thing of all time. And then the Laureate job came open and the Laureate job was adolescent inpatient eating disorder dietitian. And all three of those things sounded absolutely terrifying to me. Me and Jesus really had to sit down and talk about it because that was just nothing at all what I wanted to do. But I think people end up where they're meant to be. I ended up getting the job. I worked under Leah Graves for um, a couple years before she left. And I mean, I've been here since 2012 now, and I, I miss my grumpy old men sometimes, but now I have grumpy teenagers. And I, I cannot see myself doing anything else. I truly, truly, truly believe people end up where they are supposed to be because, man, it was just a total twist of fate that I ended up here. Sure. So you mentioned that you studied or that Leah Graves was there. What else yep. did, what else were your resources to help you learn what you did learn? And what's a typical day like for you at Laureate? Well, we're, we are an interdisciplinary treatment team. So I work with therapists, a couple other dietitians, the doctor, the nurses, and really a a bulk of my knowledge just came from listening to, to the years and years and years of experience that were in our treatment team meetings every morning. We meet as a whole team every morning. Mm -hmm. Therapists like Nicole Wood Barclow and Nancy Park, if you've been in the eating disorder field, these are names that you've heard. Hearing, hearing what the therapists have to say 
listening to Leah Graves, sitting in, in some of her sessions, really a, a bulk, the bulk of my knowledge came from just listening and, and having conversations with the people around me and asking a lot of questions like, okay, this patient just had a complete come apart in my office. What do I do about it? And then learning from that. It's, it's a lot of on the job learning. Yeah. Well, how can dietitians who don't have that privilege, how can they connect with others? Do you do supervision? You do some case consults? I do case consults. I have one coming up, I think in September and I believe another one in December, but I mean, in the before times, before COVID, um, we had professional side visits here at Laureate at least once a month. So Claire Gish, when she was still here and I would connect with those professionals. I'm, I'm really open to supervision with people. I have dietitians all over the country that I've worked with, with their clients who still email me questions. I actually had a mom of a client who ended up becoming a dietitian. She's reached out to me a few times. That's really exciting. Yeah. This, yeah. I, dietitians got to stick together. It's a really hard field. I always joke that the dietitian is the most despised member of the treatment team. Mm-hmm. So we anytime are. someone needs questions, help, anything, we all, we got to stick together. We got to help each other. And that's the hardest. I do remember that, that you're not going to be liked, Beth, when you, and I started at an inpatient hospital unit uh, for eating disorders and that bothered me. It really did. But I had to realize that that wasn't It wasn't me. It was their eating disorder. Yeah. I'm really grateful that you do those consultations because I do have a supervisee who reached out, who I forwarded the information to, and you keep those at small groups. uh, And is there a reason for that? I am not sure. Probably just so everyone can have a chance to be heard. I know that I'm not the only one doing them here at Loria. I know Dr. Moseman has one. Um, Dr. Godwin has one. I think they're just kind of rotating us through, but my email is, is out there. People are always welcome to shoot me an email. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Thank you so much. How about books? You mentioned you have a bookcase full of stuff. Oh man. Well, I'm looking at it right now. And for the dietitians listening, my Krause's food and nutrition therapy is just front and center. I paid a lot of money for that book. <laughs> um, it's right next to some of my Harry Potter books, actually. I, I'm more like kind of the, the personal story kind of books. I have a lot of Jenny Schaefer's books. I'm looking at mirror, mirror off the wall right now. I love the body project book because I know a lot about the science of things. A lot of my books are more trying to understand the emotional work, the feelings behind this whole eating disorder thing. Cause feelings are not my most favorite thing of all time. I always joke that food has no feelings. That's why I'm a dietitian and not a therapist. So really trying to understand the emotional story behind these. Father Hunger is another one of my favorite ones to recommend for families to read, especially the dads out there. Mm -hmm. So really uh, read it with a box of Kleenex. Have you read Meaningful by Ali Spots de Lazar? Oh, no. Okay. Well, you should because it's all about stories. So I think that you would really like it. It's like 23 stories of different individuals with eating disorders. It's a good one. Oh, yeah, you should hold it up so she can see the. I know this is the podcast, but yeah, a cute cover. Yeah. yeah, you can get it on Amazon even. So she's a CEDS and you're a CEDRD, yeah, certified mm-hmm. eating disorders registered dietitian. What made you decide to become certified? Well, it just kind of seemed like the next logical step. I mean, I'd heard about it a couple of well, several years ago when I had been at I, the IADEP conference. And then as I saw it kind of becoming more and more prevalent, I was like, well, gosh, I've done this for five ever. Why don't I have that? So just seemed like the natural logical step. Glad that you did. I mean, it just signifies, it doesn't mean that people who have been doing this for years aren't and aren't certified aren't good. It just does. I mean, it's a process, right? It sure is. Yeah. That exam was not my most favorite thing ever. No, and it is many hours of supervision and 2,500 practice hours and then 24 hours with your supervisor, et cetera, if you're doing the traditional route, which that's the only method or the only route now. But mm-hmm. I want to get back to Laureate because it's a cool program. And I have been in Kansas City for many years and has still have not yet been down for a site visit. But with COVID, I know that I, I will once things lighten up. But Dr. Mosman has come up to children. Children's Mercy to visit with us and um, all of the folks in your area. I'm 
attending webinars and learning so much. What's a day for you at Laureate, Valerie? Well, on the adolescent side, and the adult side has a little bit different schedule, but on the adolescent side, I'm in my office by about 7, 15, 7 30 in the morning, just because it's really my only quiet time before my patients hit the floor. My office door opens directly onto where the girls hang out, so I'm accessible to them all day. But our interdisciplinary treatment team starts at nine. So again, we all meet all together. We discuss every single client every single morning kind of make sure that we're still on track with things, talk about anything that came up from the day before, kind of things we want to accomplish for this day. Treatment team meeting lasts anywhere from an hour to two hours, just depending on what's going on. Usually I'll have an admission or I'll see another client or two before lunch. Our clients have lunch at noon. I do lunch with my clients every Wednesday. And today is macaroni and cheese day. It is the greatest day of all time. It's cheese. Um, Yeah, cheese is my favorite. So love that. So today's mac and cheese day. And then afternoons, it's usually sessions, family sessions. I run a nutrition goals group every Tuesday. Such a fun group. I always give out stickers for every goal that we accomplish. And man, those stickers are a very big deal. We don't have enough time to do stickers. There's like a mob outside my office. Very, very big deal. But mostly my family sessions are later in the afternoon. I really like my family sessions to be kind of how I end my day. So my families can take kind of as long as they need. So I'm not running up against another session. Yeah. And just kind of putting out fires as the day goes along. Um, Usually when I get home from work, my husband will say, well, how was today? And I say, oh, usual amount of chaos. Yeah, for sure. I want to say that you said Mac and Cheese Day is the best. I am thinking about your clients, your patients. Like, what do they think about Mac and Cheese Day? Well, they always joke that on my lunch day, there's probably something with cheese in it, that I have worked the menu somehow to always have cheese. And that's not the case. I didn't do that. I promise. But I I like sitting down and eating with my girls. I, I would never ask my patients to eat something that I wasn't fully willing to eat myself. That does include mushrooms. And I have very strong opinions about mushrooms, but I will mm. eat that with my girls. It's just really fun to sit there and, and you know, show them there's joy in this food. I love this. I'm, mm. I'm having a really good time eating this and let me sit down and do this with you. Sometimes there are tears. Like if we have a girl who has a birthday, I always joke that we have cake and tears at three o'clock, mm. um, but yeah. it's, it's really important to sit down and, and walk through it with them and be there with them to do that. So we've talked a little bit about what a typical day like is for you, but I think some listeners might not fully understand what a typical day is like for a patient in your facility. Oh, yeah. Could you walk through that a little bit? Yeah. So we actually have two units. We have an acute unit and we have a residential unit. Our acute unit is kind of more like a a hospital room. Of course, it's cutesy wootsy. I mean, they even have window seats, which I'm just so jealous of. Our residential unit kind of reminds me more of my college dorms, like the more upscale ones, not the yucky ones, like the nice ones. So the girls wake up, they get their meds, they do vitals. Um, Breakfast starts at eight o'clock. So they are at breakfast from about 8 to 8.30, and then we do school. Pretty much the whole morning is school time. We have an education coordinator here on site with us, and she does all the coordination between their home schools. If they are doing distance learning anyways because of COVID, it's a little bit easier. She can identify tutoring needs, anything like that. So the girls are in school pretty much all morning until 11. 11 o'clock, they have a big group called Process Group where they will all get together, kind of talk about issues that they're all going through. If there's any issues amongst the milieu that need kind of brought to light, they'll talk about that. Lunch is at noon, from about noon to 1230, 1245, just depending on the day. And then they have another big group right after lunch, where they are kind of going over a lot of the same things from the 11 o'clock group. If someone had a hard time at lunch, or they have a family session coming up that they need to talk about just to kind of a big group time together. Then two o'clock, there's usually a psychoeducational group, whether it's a body awareness group or whether it's relapse prevention, positive affirmations. The therapists really have the freedom to kind of choose what groups they think this particular milieu needs at the time. Snack is at 2.30 and then we do yoga. We do yoga three times a week during the week. And then of course on the weekends, 
but they have yoga. We have a yoga instructor that comes to us and she has a dog and she's the best. The dog's (laughs) name is Hattie and she's just wonderful. So we get dog time every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. There is another psychoeducational group, either one of our interns. We're, We're a teaching hospital, so we always have interns in and out. Either an intern or another therapist will do that. And then dinner is at 5, 5 to 5.30. And then our nursing and our tech staff run a group at 6. And it's kind of whatever goes. I had one tech who put together this elaborate like murder mystery party thing that was just so fun. Sometimes they'll do a news group where they make a laureate newsletter. They love to write stories about us. It's pretty hilarious. Just kind of whatever goes, whatever the nurses and the techs want to do. And then PM snack is around eight. And then it's just kind of wind down time after that. Watch a movie, read some books, work on homework. Yeah, we, we, we try and keep it as structured as possible just so the girls know that there's a plan. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, sometimes we'll do fun things. Every Tuesday we go to the pool. We have a pool here on site. So the girls get to go splash around in the pool Sometimes we'll do fun snacks. We'll have water day. Oh my gosh, water day is the greatest day of, of all time because we fill up thousands of water balloons and it's staff versus clients. And it's just the most glorious, riotous good time. Oh my gosh. I, I always get the most water balloons though for some strange <laughs> reason. No idea why. Because they know you can take it. <laughs> And I'm going to give a quick shout out to Laureate, which is the Intentionally Small Not-for-Profit Eating Disorders Program in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they do provide exceptional care for women and girls since 1989. Laureate's individualized care, nature-focused campus, relational philosophy, and dedication to eating disorders research does set it apart as a national treatment landscape. It consists of independent adolescent and adult programs. So know that your patients benefit from a one to three therapist to patient ratio, full-time board certified attending psychiatrists, evidence-based medical nutrition therapy, and certified eating disorder registered dietitian and Valerie and others, and dedicated to continuity of care. So a lot of the Folks who work there are eating disorder specialists. Patients are treated by the same physician, therapist, and dietitian team from the acute level all the way through discharge. So keep that in mind. Adult patients who successfully complete inpatient program are offered 30 days of care at Magnolia House at no cost. So go to stfrancis.com backslash laureate, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Okay, um, three questions. One. Yeah. Dietitians don't know what milieu means. Well, yeah. not brand new dietitians. So what explain what that is? It's true. There's a whole different language that comes with with therapy. I when I first started here, I was like, they, these are they're saying words and I don't know what these words mean. So milieu is actually the French word for community. We really are a community-based program or a very relationship-based program. So we want the girls to recognize that they are a part of this community and what they do affects everyone around them. So milieu just sounds kind of a little bit bougier than community, but milieu is is a pretty common term that you'll hear in the field, especially for inpatient care. And then does Hattie do yoga? So Hattie does not do yoga. However, Hattie knows how to fetch and Hattie knows how to bark on command. Hattie has tons of tricks that she does. She's a border collie, so she's brilliant. Oh, and I love border collies. I could, I I can imagine if I were a patient there, I would want to be going just to see Hattie. Yep. Hattie's the best. And my third question is how do you handle the cake and tears? How do you handle the tears as a dietitian? What do you do when someone's breaking down about macaroni and cheese or cake? Well, it, it, it was hard for me. I, I really resonated with what you said earlier, Beth, about your clients just really not liking you. I am a Hufflepuff for the Harry Potter people out there. I am a very kind-hearted marshmallow on the inside. And it was very hard for me to learn how to be feared and how to be disliked so strongly. And what really helped me, I had a client one time say like, Val, you're the dietitian. I love you. I hate your job. And it was like whoosh, huge click in my head. Like, oh my gosh, you're right. They really do like me. It's just my job. And so I translate that to my clients as well. It's their eating disorder. It is really their fear that is causing them to be 
this monster sometimes in my office that's cussing me out or screaming at me or whatever. But it's very funny. There's actually a picture of my grandmother in my office. And if you cuss me out in my office, it's it's fine. You just have to apologize to Geeky because she doesn't <laughs> do that whole cuss thing. So all my clients always do it. It's so freaking funny. They'll be like cussing a blue streak at me and then they'll turn around and say, sorry, Geeky, and go on. It's very funny. Um, <laughs> but really, really trying to do that separation of person and illness. Your fear is not who you are. You get to choose who you are. So really not, not viewing the person as that illness, just trying to find who they are in their struggle. Well, it kind of relates back to what you said about there's so much learning when your feet are on the ground. This is, you know, never anything that we would learn in school about how to deal with these situations. But once you're thrown into the scenario, you kind of pick up on it. Yes. Yes. And oh my gosh, I went from grumpy old men to screaming teenagers and it, uh, whoo, it was quite a learning curve. Yeah. And even the pool day, what you when you said splashing around in the pool, it's great. I'm envisioning these girls in their swimsuits. Like mm-hmm. that that body awareness and comparison and it it you know, you're making it very fun and fun sounding. Oh, wow. yes. I, I actually, I have a giant inflatable donut in my office. I had to put it down <laughs> on the ground so it wasn't like in the shop, but I have a giant pink donut that's been here for years. If any of my former clients are listening, it's still here. I still have it, but they take it to the pool. We'll go splash around with it. It's it's, it's a lot of fun. We really want to work on that exposure work. You mentioned comparison. That's so huge in this population. Comparison well, and you're really taking, you're taking a situation that is definitely a little bit traumatizing for them, but it's like, we have to do this. They have to get these experiences to get better. It sounds like you guys do such a good job at making it somewhat enjoyable for them. We do try. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't mean I'm not going to make them mad or make them cry, but we'll have fun while we do it. And so is there preparation? Yeah. For a pool day preparation emotionally? No, not really. Not really. It's, it's a lot of exposure work. It's all right. It's four o'clock. It is time to put on your giant t-shirt. Let's get to the pool. And they, oh, but I don't want to go or it's too hard or nope, we're all going. Usually it's the clients that take care of each other though. Often we just have to hold the door open. Usually mm. the girls are really kind of pushing each other to get out there and, and oh, go. That's awesome. Part of that milieu, the community yep. of what, of helping each other, but also, you know, being triggered by one another as well. So you wrote something called, I think it's in defense of cereal. In defense of my cereal. Of your cereal. Tell us about that. So I was asked, we get periodically asked to write articles. I was asked to write an article. And when I asked, what do I, what do you want me to write it about? I was given carte blanche, which if you know anything about me, that's actually a pretty dangerous thing to say to me. Uh, because You never know what I'm going to come up with. But I had this experience where I was at Target and the only thing I was buying was cereal. And I was in the cereal aisle and the greatest cereal of all time is Captain Crunch with Berries. Hands down. I don't care who you are. You can say what you want. It's Captain Crunch with Berries. Get out of here. And there was this mom in the aisle with me with her two little kids, little boys. And I heard her say, I, to this day, I heard her say, if your cereal has cartoons on it or it's super colorful, it's not healthy and we're not buying it. And I'm standing there with, you know, Captain Crunch in my arms. It's the only thing I'm buying. It's the only reason I'm there. And she looked at me, her kids looked at me and she very clearly did like the up, down, up, down with her eyes at my cereal. And I was like, don't be judging my cereal. But I mean, as a pretty witty, funny person, normally I can like fire something off pretty fast, but I was like, so taken aback. I'm not used to doing that in the real world. Normally I don't tell people I'm a dietitian because they just tell me weird stuff. But all I could come up with was I'm a dietitian and just, you know, marched on off. It just, I could not believe that these two little boys were not going to be allowed to eat, you know, fruity pebbles or whatever it is they wanted. And so it really kind of stuck with me that, that thing, I told that story all the time, whenever I gave lectures during our family week in the before times. And so I decided to write an article about this whole misconception of the word healthy, because one of my favorite things to do with clients is talk about their idea of health. And if you crack open Merriam-Webster right now, and you look up 
healthy, you're, you're going to find a completely definition than what we actually use it for. The, the literal definition is the absence of disease. And, you know, if you look at my Captain Crunch with berries, there's no disease in there. It's just cereal. It's an inanimate object. It, it, it can't have a sign or symptom of a disease. But sitting in my office, there is a disease and it's an eating disorder. And that's really what's unhealthy is the mindset about the food, not the food itself. Mm. Food is amoral. It's just there to be what it is. So it's really looking at this idea of the word healthy and how misconstrued it's become. Do you ever get, especially with the impact of social media on teenagers and then just the diet culture world, do you ever get patients who say like, oh no, I'm not eating that. It, it's not organic or this, I'm paleo. So I can't do that. Like, how do you, how would you combat oh, girl, this? Six times a day. Oh yes. Okay. That's so, that's so common. I, I really love tearing those kinds of things apart, you know, like, so you mentioned paleo, this whole idea of, of, of eating like Neolithic man. Well, last I checked, Neanderthals didn't survive evolution. They died. So I'm not really sure why we need to eat like them since, you know, they didn't make it. Also the foods that were available to Neanderthals, they've completely evolved as well. I mean, if you look at the general evolution of tomatoes, the tomatoes that, you know, Fred Flintstone had are not the tomatoes that we have. So that whole concept is, is pretty bunk. I mean, also this idea of keto, it's amazing how many families come to me like, oh, we're, we're a keto family. And it's like, okay, well, I did a big project on the keto diet. When I was in grad school, the ketogenic diet was created to, to, to fix epilepsy. It's not created to, to lose weight. I was actually at a, a social establishment, <clears throat> a bar, and this guy had come up to me and was talking to me and told me how he was eating keto. And I said, oh my gosh, how long have you, have you had epilepsy? And he looked at me like I was nuts. And that was when I first learned that people are like doing this by choice. Like, oh, why would you do that? That's uh, genius. I I'm going to use that. Funny. That is genius. <laughs> do you get pushback from parents? It's like, for example, you said you had a, a family who was all keto. Do you get pushback for them saying, oh, no, I want my kid to still do this in treatment? Often I will. So in that case, I just have to like turn my charm up to 50 and really try and meet them where they are and try and understand why they are feeling the need to eat that way. And then really do the education around, OK, but here's what that actually means. And if you're looking for this outcome here as a dietitian is what I would recommend that you do. And here's how we're going to change the language around what you are using to describe the foods you want at home. We're an all foods fit program here. And so if I have a family who says, well, we only eat clean foods, which by the way, I don't even know what that means. And I have right. two degrees in this clean food. Like do you peroxide your food? I don't know. So if they say that it's like, okay, well, let's stop using that term. Let's instead talk about, I'm going to eat fruits. I'm going to eat vegetables. I'm going to eat chocolate. I'm going to eat this. And instead of using a descriptor to, to describe the food, good, bad, healthy, unhealthy, let's just let food be food. And let's, let's try and make sure that the, the guilt and the shame that you might be causing your kiddo to have around some of these foods that they really want to eat, like, let's, let's, let's stop that. So like, for example, I had a kid that I was working with and her family is very clean eating and um, not super receptive to a lot of the things that I had to say. And she was telling me about all of these cereals. <laughs> cereal again, that she'd never been allowed to eat. She would ask her mom for these cereals she would see on commercials and would never be allowed to have them because they were bad. And so she and her mom and I sat down and we ate a bunch of cereal. I mean, I went to the store, I bought, you name it, I bought it. And we tried all of them and we had a rating system. And for this mom, just to see her kid get so excited about things, it really was a changing moment for her to see like, oh, well, we're not going to eat you know, Cocoa Pebbles every day, but you know, this was actually kind of fun to try something different that mm. we've never done before. And, mm. and the joy that they were able to get out of that was, was pretty fun. Mm. So really trying to involve the parents in those discussions and, and try and change the mindset and the language particularly. That was really helpful because I am going through almost an identical situation right now. So I'm going to have to use that. Okay. Cereal. It, it's, it can work miracles. I'm telling you. Okay, so this is what I wanted to ask. You you had that quick comeback for the guy who was doing keto, like, oh, how, I'm sorry, how long have you had epilepsy? If you could go back to that cereal aisle now, what would you say? 
Oh my gosh. I would probably have had to bring a chair with me and sat her down and just read her the riot act. Like, I mean, having to deal with the fallout of kids who do develop eating pathology, boys and girls, like it just, you really need to be careful about the messages that you're sending your kids. I mean, for those involved in the theater world, if you think about the children will listen song from Into the Woods, I mean, children listen and people hear the messages that you're giving. And I mean, gosh, in this age of really trying to destigmatize mental health and be positive, body positive and all of these things, like why are we still holding on to such negative messages? What would I say to this mom now? I don't know. I'd probably pray for her. I have no idea. <laughs> bring a chair to Target next yeah, time. Bring a chair. <laughs> Sit it down, mom. We got some talking to do. <laughs> oh, this is so entertaining. I I just oh I when I was research doing some research on you, I found that serial article and I immediately sent it over to Beth. I'm like, look yeah. at what Valerie wrote. Back in yes. 2012, you're yeah. a very good writer too. And you mentioned that Laureate has you guys write articles every once in a while. Where could we find all those? Is it just on the Laureate site? Probably on the Laureate site. There are several, gosh, I think almost all of my colleagues here have written at least one. During during COVID, we've been a little bit more stretched thin. So I have not actually written an article, I think, since that serial article. Actually, mm-hmm. gosh, I probably better write another one. Yeah, they should be on the website. Yeah. Okay. One of the phrases that you said today was let food be food. I love that. And I think that that could be another thing that your your patients give you that I'm looking at behind you. There's all kinds of beautiful drawings and phrases and things that, and, and, and your grandma is in there. <laughs> that is brilliant. Yes, is. That's brilliant. Yes, she is. A, a lot of my clients on the opposite wall, there's a sign that says, that's why I'm a dietitian, not a therapist. There's a whole poem that a patient wrote about me and calories because Valerie rhymes with calorie. And she thought that was so funny. Is so it a, a long poem? Dis- I would love to. Um, it says Valerie, she's my gallery. She doesn't like to count calories. She says, I need more variety. Although a sessions can be a pain in the end. I love you all the same. All my behaviors are so lame. My ED is the one to blame. So cute. Oh my gosh. I love it. You are right where you're supposed to be, Valerie. People end up where they're supposed to be. I feel sorry for the old men that are missing out on you, but I'm glad (laughs) Gloria has you. My my poor grumpy men. That's okay. It reminds me a little bit of a social worker I worked with when I was at the children's hospital. And she would say, these are my dream boat. You know, the hardest cases are the ones that she really, really loved. Otherwise, you know, what good are we? Okay, Valerie. So taking yourself back to entering the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you do know now? That it is really okay to be hated. It's really okay to upset your clients. It's really okay to make them cry. You should not compromise what you know to be the right thing to do in order to make someone like you. It's really important to build a relationship with your clients, but it is not okay to sacrifice, you know, pushing them and really making them uncomfortable in order to achieve that goal. There are other ways to connect with them. Oh my gosh, boundaries are like my most favorite thing in the entire world, aside from cheese and Harry Potter and my husband and my dog. But just really, your clients will have a, they will have a sense of safety knowing that you're going to hold the line and you're going to be there for them, even when they're screaming at you. That's probably the, the hardest lesson I had to learn was it is really okay to be feared and it's okay to be hated because it's not forever. Mm-hmm. And it's not you. It's not me. It's, it's the not disease. me, but it's, it's really hard. And anytime I have an intern, that's always the first thing I tell them is, you know, if, if you want your clients to like you, you are in the wrong field. And if your clients are miserable, then you're probably doing your job really well. That's very <laughs> true. So you mentioned there's a way to get a hold of you if people have questions. Yeah. Don't try and call me. Um, I'm very rarely hanging out on my desk. I'm always bebopping all over the place. So it's an exercise in futility to try and call me. Good luck. But my email, I'll just give it. It's V-E-Grogan, G-R-O-G-A-N 
and then the little at doodle St. Francis, all spelled out, S-A-I-N-T-F-R-A-N-C-I-S dot com. As I said, dietitians got to stick together. This is a really, really hard field. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Mm -hmm. if we're there to support each other, you know, across different treatment facilities, across state lines, we we really got to help each other out. This is a really hard job. Mm, thank you so much for that because, and also even the books that you recommend, those are more based on stories and Jenny Schaefer's Life Without Ed and Goodbye Ed, Hello Me. And um, she's part of also Almost Anorexic, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I have all these books too. <laughs> and I had someone ask me if I've read all of them and I'm not going to answer that today because... I would embarrass myself, (laughs) but I like some of the, just the titles. Well, the, the, the most uh, interesting book I've probably ever read is the Effort Diet. Yeah. Like actually say that, but it is, that is a, that was, Brooke was a very validating reading experience. Mm -hmm. I've had clients really say, this is refreshing. You know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of the new wave, like intuitive eating. I've also had clients say that, that, that there are parts of it that actually they don't like, like it just seems like another diet. So those are the nuances that we get to as dietitians. Like we don't know what's on your mind. We Mm -hmm. we, tell us, you know, tell us, and then we can kind of piece it together. And I just put out a message on the IFED listserv. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, Valerie. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients had found a book that was a cookbook and I had never seen it before. So I just kind of took my chance on putting it out there, but it talked about clean eating. It talked about the perfectly perfect. It was the re, you know, it was a, a based on Christianity and the, my client is very in tune and um, that's something that speaks to her. And so I just put it back on her and said, what do you think about it? She said, well, I think that this person looks like a Barbie doll. And I think that there's a lot of fake things in here. And she uses the word clean eating. And I don't think that that's a thing. And I mean, she was able to just like put it all out there. So the effort diet and other books that we may come across, we don't know how that's going to land for our client. And it's just really helpful when they can verbalize that. Mm Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks to Laureate for um, allowing you this time with us, which means that that's time away from your patients and clients. But we, we can't actually, Abby, I think like we have to have Valerie back after she writes her (laughs) next things. And I'm honored. (laughs) Thank you, Valerie. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethherald.com slash professionals.